Hey everybody! Have you ever had your Apple TV Siri remote ever just stop working? Or have difficulty with the volume controls? In this video, I'll show you how to fix it. So let's get to it! First thing to do, if you start having issues with your Apple TV Siri remote, where it either doesn't do anything or doesn't seem to work, is to make sure it's charged. Plug it in and charge it for at least 15 minutes to make sure the battery in it is charged enough to work. Depending on when you got your Apple TV or Siri remote, it will either charge with a lightning charger like an iPhone 14 or older, or USB-C like the new iPhone 15s. Both ports are located in the same place at the bottom of the remote. I found this is mostly what happens for most people when the remote doesn't work as it's really easy to forget to charge it. After you've charged the Apple remote, try using it again. If it still doesn't work, then make sure you're using it close enough to your Apple TV box. Less than 20 feet or 6 meters away from the Apple TV box. Also, if it's in a cabinet with a door, temporarily open the door and try the remote close to it to see if the door is interfering with the signal. If your Apple TV Siri remote still isn't working, then manually restart your Apple TV by unplugging the Apple TV box for at least 10 seconds and then plugging it back in. After your Apple TV restarts, if your Siri remote still isn't working, then you can try restarting the Apple TV remote itself. To do this, press and hold the Control Center button and Volume Down button at the same time. Hold the buttons down for about 5 seconds, or until the status light on your Apple TV turns off and then on again. Then release the buttons and wait 5 to 10 seconds for a connection loss notification to appear on your Apple TV screen. Wait a few moments while your remote restarts. When the connected notification appears, you can use your remote. I've never needed to restart the remote myself since I've had my Apple TV, but when I did it for this video, I found the response time when using the remote actually got faster. It wasn't bad before, but it had a slight lag. Now it's lightning fast. So if you might want to restart the remote every so often, just to keep things running quickly. And if after all this, the Apple TV Siri remote still doesn't seem to work, then you can pair or repair your remote to your Apple TV box again. To do this, point your Siri remote at your Apple TV and make sure that the remote is about 3 inches from your Apple TV. So you'll need to be really close to the Apple TV box to do this. Press and hold the back button and volume up button for about 5 seconds. You may be asked to place your remote on top of your Apple TV box. If so, don't worry, this is normal. If after all this the Apple TV Siri remote still doesn't work, then I would recommend contacting Apple for further support, as there isn't much more you can do as a user. With any luck, it will never get that far. The Apple TV Siri remote has been a great remote, being really user friendly and easy to use, with few, if any, problems reported by most. If you'd like to learn more about how to use the Siri Remote, stay tuned for the bonus video, Siri Remote User Guide. Thanks for watching! Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that bell for more tech videos, including tech how to's. See you in the next one! Hey everybody! Welcome to my video about how to use the new Apple TV 4K remote. In this video, I'll be going over all the features, tips, and tricks for using your Apple TV 4K remote. So stay tuned! I recently bought the new Apple TV 4K and have really been enjoying it. While I found the remote to be reasonably user-friendly, I did have to research some things here and there to try to figure it out. So I thought I'd make this user guide to show you all the features of the new remote, and even some tips about how to use it better. First, we'll start at the top and work our way down. Of course, we have the power button at the top. Press and hold to turn your Apple TV box and television on and off. Then, beneath that is the click pad with touch surface. Essentially, this is a touch sensitive D-pad that lets you navigate through menus and choose options. You can either use it like a D-pad to move around the screen by clicking the directional buttons, or you can swipe. It's pretty cool. In the middle is the select button, for lack of a better name. You press that select button to run an app or select the option highlighted on the screen. A neat new trick you can do, since it's a touch surface, is use it like a jog wheel to scroll through video. First, pause the video using the play pause button. Then just touch and hold for a moment. 
and then start to circle clockwise or counterclockwise depending on the direction you want to shuffle the video in. While this is a cool feature, I prefer just using the left and right buttons for this, as I personally find it easier. Just click the right or left button when the video is playing to jump in 10 second intervals. Other cool features of the touch surface, swipe down for menu. On the Apple TV app, it gives you the options for subtitles and audio. On the Netflix app, it also gives you the info tab. And another hidden or less talked about option is that if you double tap the select button, not press, just touch but double touch or tap, it can change the aspect ratio of some video content. I've noticed this works in some movies that are in widescreen with the black bars at the top and bottom. It will magnify the video to get rid of the bars. This also works in older TV shows that are in the old 4x3 aspect ratio. But this doesn't seem to do anything for newer TVs or content that is already in 16x9. Moving on, we have the back button below on the left of the touch surface click pad. It's pretty self-explanatory. It takes you back to the previous option or screen, but has what I have found to be a couple of neat little tricks as well. If you're watching content through the Apple TV app and press the back button, it will give you the description of the TV show or movie you're watching, including the runtime, rating, video quality, audio type if available, and if there is closed captioning. And it will give you the option to start from the beginning again. In the Netflix app, it will bring you to a similar screen with more options. As a fun bonus feature, if you press the back button from the home screen, it will run the screensaver. Next we have the TV Control Center button. In its default configuration, it will toggle between the Apple TV app or the home screen depending on what's running. However, you can also change this setup in the settings so it just takes you to the home screen every time you press it. I personally prefer it this way. To change the behavior of the button, go to the Settings app, go down to Remotes and Devices, then select TV button. Now will only take you to the home screen and it will no longer toggle between the Apple TV app and the home screen. If you press and hold the button, it will bring up Control Center. Control Center gives you the time and date in the upper right corner. The Sleep button, which is pretty much a duplicate of the power button on the remote. The Now Playing widget, a shortcut to a reduced version of the Home app that lets you run any of your favorite scenes for your smart home setup. A shortcut to the Apple TV Search app and a cool audio output option similar to what you can do on your iPhone. In my case, I have my Apple TV set up to default to the HomePod stereo pair in the living room. But sometimes I want the audio to play throughout my condo, so I can also send the audio to my bedroom HomePod mini as well. This option is great when listening to music for get-togethers. Continuing on, next we have the play pause button, which is a pretty simple button. It just plays or pauses whatever you're watching. If you're watching something from the Apple TV app, you also get the picture in picture option when you play from the button. After you press play from being paused, select the picture in picture button above the timeline. It's kind of a cool option. Below the play pause button is the mute button. Pretty simple. Press once to mute the audio, again to bring it back to where it was. And of course, beside that we have the volume up and down buttons. Again, pretty self-explanatory there. You can press and hold for the volume to slide up or click it to go in increments. Now for the last button, which is a Siri button on the right side of the remote. When you want to use Siri on the Apple TV, just press and hold the button while speaking into the mic near the top of the remote. Hey Siri, what's the weather? With Siri on the remote, you can do anything from check the weather, run smart home automations, lights, and even use your voice to control the Apple TV box. One thing to note for those using Siri shortcuts for home automation, Siri on the Apple TV doesn't seem to be able to run those. At least I can't seem to get any to work, which I think is so odd since Siri on the HomePods will run them as long as your iPhone is on your Wi-Fi network. Just thought it might be helpful to know. But you can use Siri to run an app like Netflix, or even run a specific TV show or movie. I found through my use it's pretty good, but not always perfect. Like my search for the movie The Martian. The Martian. I already own this movie. I have the digital copy that came with the Blu-ray in iTunes or Apple TV. So it's already in my library, but when I do a Siri search from the home screen, I get the option to buy, rent, or open it in Disney+, Plus, not to watch it from my library. But overall, it's not too bad. One cool bonus trick with the Siri button, if you have a scene where you're not sure what was said, you can press the Siri remote and say, what did he say? And it will go back a bit and turn on the closed captioning, so you can see what was said. It's pretty cool. That's all the buttons, but the last thing I want to briefly discuss is how to charge the remote. It uses the same lightning connector as most Apple products, like AirPods and iPhones, and is located at the bottom of the remote. 
the battery in the Siri remote should last you quite some time. Most people I've talked to said they charge it two to three times a year. The Apple TV is supposed to let you know when the remote needs to be charged on screen when the battery gets low. But if you'd like to check out the battery level on your remote anytime, you can just go to the settings menu, then choose remotes and devices, then go down and choose remote. It will tell you the serial number, firmware version, and of course, the current battery level of your remote. While using the new Apple TV 4K, I've had to look up things here and there and have learned lots of little tips and tricks, some of which I shared in this video. If you'd like to see an Apple TV tips and tricks video, please let me know in the comments below. If enough people ask for it, I'll do one. Did I miss any features of the new Apple TV 4K remote? Please share with us in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video or found it helpful, feel free to give it a thumbs up. And while you're down there, don't forget to ring that bell and subscribe to the channel for more tech videos, including tech how-tos every week. As always, thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.